The Darwinists would say, um, well, you've forgotten about natural selection. Natural selection is the evolutionist magic bullet. And so my training was in genetics, specifically in plant genetics, specifically in plant breeding and crop improvement. And my, um, my trade for decades was selection. And so I actually know quite a bit about selection. But most of what I know about selection, I've only learned in the last few years. This is one area where I feel I have genuine authority to speak. There's much I don't know, but this is an area where I feel I can speak with authority. Selection works in a very, very limited context. You can select for a very bad gene, but you can't t select for a typical deleterious gene because a typical deleterious gene is too subtle too tiny in its effect. It's like the rust atoms in your car. You don't see them, so you can't select for them. And likewise, you can select for a very beneficial mutation. Let's say a mutation that would help you adapt to some type of environmental stress, like an antibiotic. That's very easy. But what you can't do is select for the typical nucleotide in the genome that carries infinitesimally small part of the total information in the genome. And that's what we're going to talk a little about today. Darwin still reigns. The primary axiom is the most powerful intellectual paradigm, I believe, in all of history. It has taken all of intelligentsia captive. It reigns supreme in all of academia. It governs our culture, which is why our culture is doing what it's doing. What if this Darwinian theory could be falsified? Would that, would that make a difference? You say, no, I, I think it would make a big difference. So there is going to be a very, because of the power of this delusion, and because many people don't want to believe it, many people will not believe it, even if you can demonstrate it very powerfully. But there are many, many people who have been taken captive unwillingly by this deception. And for those people, there will be liberation. Because Darwin's powerful delusion can now be falsified rigorously and scientifically. So there's two different ways that we can falsify it. One is by using logic. And so actually, amazingly, if you read carefully the literature, the technical literature of population genetics over the last several decades, you'll find many, many of the world's best population geneticists who are saying, uh, there's a fundamental problem with our theory. It doesn't really work. And, but the, that has not been communicated to the rest of the scientific community. It's kind of like a trade secret. And it certainly hasn't been communicated to the public. But that has been summarized in a book called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome, which is available in your bookstore here. And um, it, it's, it makes the, the trade secret public information. And I'm just going to quickly list the points here because we're going to then move on to something even more persuasive, even more conclusive. But the, basically, the fatal flaws, the logical fatal flaws of the neo-Darwinian theory are as follows. Number one, if you have a very high mutation rate, with most of the mutations being bad, there's no selection scheme that can keep up with the mutations as they flood into the population. You can only select away a certain fraction of the population. And it's, uh, the analogy I would make is you're standing in a boat, and it's leaking, and you're bailing, and the water's coming into the boat faster than you can bail. Okay? Natural selection does get rid of some of the worst mutations, but it can't keep up with mutation rate. Uh, even It can only get rid of a few percent of the, all the bad mutations. And so that's outlined in the book, and I'm not going to dwell on it, except I think intuitively you can probably see that that's obvious. Secondly is, in nature, there's a great deal of survival of the luckiest. If you just think about uh, the seeds from a tree, a great n a number of those seeds, regardless of whether they carry good or bad genes, are going to land in places where they won't grow. They're eaten, they fall. It's, it's like the biblical story of the seeds. Some will fall on rocky ground, some will be eaten by birds, and the lucky ones will survive. That's not survival of the fittest, it's survival of the luckiest. Because of that type of background noise in the biological system, 
most bad mutations can't be selected away. Even if, you could, um, even if your mutation rate was low, most bad mutations are too subtle, too nearly invisible to affect reproductive success. And equally, uh, good mutations are overwhelmingly too subtle for selection. And if that wasn't bad enough, it turns out that the good and bad mutations that are accumulating in our genome, now of course the good ones are extremely rare, but they're physically linked. They're actually on adjacent parts of the chromosome, so you can't, selection can't sort out the good from the bad, which is essential for natural selection to work. And um, these fatal flaws, if you talk to a population geneticist, they won't contest any of them. They'd say, yeah, we know that. Well, then how do you still justify teaching this as a dogma, as a doctrine? Um, well, they said, we're, we're, we're just, basically they retreat to a faith position. And, and it's, you have to uh, experience it to believe it. Um, but there's this even a stronger way to falsify that. So if you want to understand the logic, uh, the logical flaws uh, of neo-Darwinian theory, I urge you to read the book Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. 